Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Dr. Frieden, we have uh, a limited amount of time and a lot to talk about, so let's jump right in. I was hoping you could start us with a, a status update. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of people in this room, a lot of people in Miami, who want to hear from you on the latest uh, uh, in terms of prevention and spread of Zika. So can you give us a sort of a two or three minute overview? Sure. First, globally, um, we're seeing Zika in more than 50 countries around the world. We're seeing it now in Southeast Asia. And uh, I would say at the outset that there's still a lot we don't know about Zika. We're literally learning more every day. In the U.S., in the continental U.S., we continue to have travel-associated cases. We've had more than 3,000 travel-associated cases. And a rule of thumb is for every case you diagnose, you've probably got about 10 more. Because Zika usually doesn't manifest itself in right. uh, it's minor fluish, usually, right? Four out of five people have no symptoms whatsoever. The one who does has mild symptoms, so may not get diagnosed. So in the U.S., we've had literally tens of thousands of Zika infections, including more than 3,000 diagnosed, and about 900 pregnant women in the continental U.S. Uh, who got Zika infection during travel. Right. In addition, in Puerto Rico, they've really been in the eye of the storm, and they've had um, at least two, perhaps as many as 6,000 pregnant women infected with Zika. Can you just pause there and open up that, uh, open up that question a little bit? Of those women, both here uh, in the mainland U.S. and Puerto Rico, how many have come to term and have we seen anything yet in terms of microcephaly or other manifestations of Zika? In the continental U.S., we've seen 23 infants born to mothers who had Zika infection who have complications that appear to be associated. We've done work at CDC to confirm that Zika is the cause of microcephaly. Actually, in January, the head of our pathology laboratory called me over and showed me he had developed a stain that could identify the Zika RNA wow. and had used that uh, to look at, examine the brains of two babies who had died in the first 24 hours in Brazil from severe microcephaly. And it was a horrifying picture. It showed the virus just invading the brain cells. It's what's called a neurotropic virus. It grows in the brain. It grows in the placenta also. So what we know is that it appears that the greatest risk for microcephaly is in the first and early second trimester of pregnancy. What we don't know is what will happen to all of the other babies. Even in the first and second trimester, it's around 5 to 10 percent have, have microcephaly. But will the rest be completely healthy, or will we only find out in a few months or a few years that they have hearing or vision or cognitive problems? To figure that out, we'll be doing long-term studies, particularly in Colombia, as well as in Puerto Rico and elsewhere, and in the U.S., of course. Come back to the, to the, to the situation right here, uh, because this is, the, this is uh, the epicenter of the mainland U.S. problem. Talk about where we are in Miami, Miami Beach. Miami-Dade had the misfortune of being the first place in the continental U.S. with local transmission of Zika. First happened in a community called Wynwood, which is kind of a hipster community. There's lots of stuff going on. Uh, they've got, people are chuckling here. They, they know we want to make people sympathetic to yeah. them, so don't yeah. refer to them as a hipster community, if you don't mind. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. community. It's an got interesting lots community. of Eclectic interesting community. stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, awesome. But from a, from a mosquito standpoint, it's a great place. Really? Mosquitoes <laughs> love Wynwood. <laughs> because right. uh, it's got everything. It's got construction sites, vacant lots, Lots of people outdoors all the time, outdoor dining. Standing pools of water on construction lots being lots. The... Very difficult to get rid of all of the water that would control Zika. How small does a, a pool of water need to be in order to be a, be a place where Zika can breed and mosquitoes? A bottle cap. That's a problem. Yes. That's a serious problem. That means bromeliad plants. That means a coffee cup that got discarded. That means the top of a coffee cup that got discarded. That means any place where you have garbage that you don't have covered. Very, very difficult. The only two places that have controlled dengue spread by the same mosquito are Singapore, which is air-conditioned and has 500 full-time inspectors to work on this, and Cuba, which sends the army out to every single house and still right, has right, clusters. Right, right, right. right. That, that makes a certain amount of sense. Yeah. So the dictatorship has its virtues every so often, right? Oh, no, the, I would uh, say that. No, 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 no. I'm not putting you on the spot on, on commenting on democracy, especially right now. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Come, come, back to, come back to this basic question I think the average person in, in, in this part of Florida would want to know. Uh, do you feel that you have this under control 
in Miami-Dade? Zika is extremely difficult to control. Dengue is difficult to control. But you have to understand just how uh, difficult this mosquito is. Not only can it breed in a bottle cap, uh, but it's highly resistant in different places to different insecticides that we use. It bites four or five people in one blood meal, so it's really good at spreading disease. You don't feel it when it bites you. you this is how it, it became, it. this is how you develop local transmission over yes. the summer, correct? Yes. Some, I mean, the mosquitoes learned from people who were visiting how to transmit and then transmitted. A visitor with Zika who may have been asymptomatic got bitten by one of those mosquitoes, which right. then a week later matures in their body and for weeks can then spread it to others. Right. So it, very tough to control Zika. Very important what they did in Wynwood. In Wynwood, they, they did everything possible. They have an excellent mosquito control program here. One of the best in the country, one of the best in the world. How many inspectors? Uh, they have a contract. So they start with a small number, and then they can bring in, they had at one point over 100 teams working. Is Singapore the, the gold standard from your perspective? I don't know enough about their program. I will say that even with that program, they had cases, and they were fully transparent about the cases. They said, here's where they are, Here's what we're doing about them, all the information publicly available. The, the Im really important experience with Wynwood was that despite doing everything right, they still had fairly high mosquito counts. So we recommended, and they did aerial spraying. It was controversial with ultra low volume nalids, an organophosphate pesticide. We don't like to use pesticides, except as in the last resort, and aerial spraying with a natural larvicide. So you're killing both the adult and the larval forms of mosquitoes. And Literally within a day, the mosquito counts went to zero. More than 90% of the mosquitoes that were in traps were killed. Um, and uh, after four applications, with continued application of the larvicide, mosquito counts haven't rebounded for the past month and no more cases. Let me, let me stay on this question because I, I, maybe you're resistant to, to answering the question, uh, do you feel like you have this under control or not? But we're... You've dealt with a lot of emergencies. Where do you feel you are on the, on the spectrum? Or on, are you, have you reached a tipping point where you feel like you've mastered this, or you feel like this is not yet, you're not where you want to be? So here's the plain truth. Tell me the plain truth. Um, that uh, Zika and other diseases spread by Aedes aegypti are really not controllable with current technologies. Thank you for the blunt spoken truth. So that was great. we will see this become endemic in the hemisphere. Now, it may be that we have a vaccine in a couple of years. It may be that we come up with new technologies to control mosquitoes. You know, you, you say that dictatorship has benefits. Uh, a few decades ago in Brazil, under the dictatorship, uh, a Dr. Soper, who was the, referred to as the general of uh, mosquito control, tried to eradicate Aedes aegypti from the hemisphere, and he got very close. Come to that. I, I want to talk about vaccine, and I want to talk about what your epidemiologists and your analytics people are telling you how this is going to move. But, but come back to this, this question of mosquito eradication. Uh, we are at a phase in science where it's possible to talk about the possibility of eradicating a whole species of mosquitoes. This is the cockroach of mosquitoes, as yes. you say frequently, not easily eradicated, and one of the most indestructible species on the planet. But there are ways to genetically engineer this, this mosquito, theoretically at least, out of existence. Uh, I'm asking you to go, I'm asking you to answer this question uh, as, uh, as the head of the CDC, uh, as a scientist and also as, I don't want to put too much on you, but as a philosopher in a way or as a member of the human species, do we want to go down that pathway? And, and if you could approach it from each of those angles, it might be interesting. Yes, yes, and yes. Oh, all right. Okay. It first won't be off, that interesting. It'll be very clear. First off, it's an invasive species. It's not native to this hemisphere. You would eradicate the enti an entire well, species in order to protect humans. First off, there are hundreds of species of mosquitoes. Only a few carry disease. Right. If those species of mosquitoes were eliminated, it might have some effect on bird and bat populations, but very minimal because there are lots of other species as well from everything I've seen. But more to the point, malaria still kills 400,000 people a year. Zika is going to cause birth defects and tremendous disruption in travel plans and personal plans for years to come. If we could get rid of this mosquito, I'd be very happy. And, and, and you, there's no downstream consequence of human beings eradicating an entire species of life in order this to... This particular species. This particular... Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And you think you can... Main, you, you think the science is capable of doing that and not affecting other species? We're not there yet. Um, we're not there yet, but we may be there soon. And we're thinking about, for example, in Miami-Dade, both of them... I've just met with the mayor of Miami-Dade, the mayor of Miami Beach, 
Uh, they're very focused on doing the right thing. They're very focused on doing what they can uh, and trying every approach and looking rigorously at it. There was just a proposal, actually, to, to introduce large numbers of bats into Miami Beach. Uh, I think you may, they might have come up in your meeting. I mean, it sounds like the beginning of a very bad horror movie, obviously. But, <laughs> but is that, I mean, it, it, are you open to any sort of idea like that? Is that effective? Bats do eat thousands of mosquitoes a day. We've looked at it. And yeah. given the number of mosquitoes that bats eat and the number of mosquitoes out there, it's not likely to have How many mosquitoes are out there? A lot. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> his scientific answer is a lot. The, uh, come to the vaccine. How far away do you think we are? I mean, if a vaccine doesn't solve uh, your infectious disease problem. It could solve your Zika problem. Is that fair to say? Well, first off, we're optimistic that a vaccine is possible. You're working on a number of tracks on this, correct? That's right. And so I talked a little lead. bit about that. But first off, if you look at malaria or HIV, human immunity isn't very good. Right. So to say that we can do better than Mother Nature is very difficult. Decades and decades have gone by work on AIDS and malaria vaccines without progress. But in contrast, when it comes to Zika and viruses like Zika, our immune response to it is very strong, long-lasting and possibly lifelong. So we think that there will be approaches that give safe and effective vaccines. It usually takes five to 10 years to bring a vaccine to market at best. We're hoping that in two or three years, a vaccine might be widely available. So the people of Florida should not be looking to a vaccine as a short-term solution to a serious problem. That's right. And, and for this area specifically, we've reiterated the recommendation that people who live in Miami-Dade who are pregnant or have visited here get tested for Zika. And you're, and you're adamant that people who are pregnant or are thinking about getting pregnant should not come to Miami-Dade. We're adamant that they shouldn't go to Little River and Miami Beach, and we're suggesting that they really consider not How coming to the rest of... How short can you be that, that, I mean, mosquitoes fly. Mosquitoes can get into people's cars and move from neighborhood to neighborhood. How sure are you when you say that there are, there are delineate blocks of a city and, 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 and tell people, just don't go into this neighborhood and you'll be okay? I mean, it seems... So these mosquitoes don't fly very far. They only fly about 500 feet in their whole lifetime, and most of them don't fly that far. And their far. lifetime is... Uh, about a month. A month, right. About a month. Uh, so these, the disease spreads in people, it hitchhikes in our blood, right. and then another mosquito bite. So what you've seen in Miami-Dade uh, is three areas where there has been prolonged, persistent uh, spread. Wynwood, where it's been stopped, um, and we think is you know, in a good shape right now with very low mosquito counts. Uh, Miami Beach, both the north part and the south part, and uh, most recently Little River. And so we, we're particularly concerned about those places. However, there are also several dozen other cases around the city that are not associated with any of those clusters. Right. What we think happens there, we think about nine out of 10 times when there's local transmission, it dead ends with that individual and it doesn't spread further. But about one out of 10 times you get a Wynwood or Little River or, uh, or Miami Beach. But because there may be transmission, that's why we're recommending that all pregnant women in the city get tested for Zika. I want to go in a minute to some national questions, questions about funding and emergency funding of disease prevention and control. But, but stay, there's an there's a audience of mayors and people who work with mayors and NGOs. Uh, lessons learned so far. Um, talk about what you've learned from, how, how about this, talk about what you've learned from the mayors of Miami and Miami Beach and what lessons you would transmit Sorry to use the word. Uh, it's on my mind. Uh, to other mayors who are who could be facing what they're facing here in another after another year. Let's say. Well, first off, invest in public health. It pays off. It doesn't necessarily uh, give you the kind of glitzy thing of opening a new building or doing something that has a, a people demanding it. But it's going to protect you. It's going to protect your economy. It's going to protect your citizens. It's going to reduce your health care costs. Investing in public health is the best buy. What specific sh short-term emergency fixes do you, have you seen that are actually, uh, it strikes me as an interesting idea? First, track for mosquitoes carefully so you can identify where their problems. Turned out that construction sites were a big problem. So the mayors are implementing construction codes that are tighter, working with the construction industry, explaining what they should do. Turns out that elevator pits are a problem. Elevator so at the pits. bottom of elevator, there's standing water. 
And that's uh, where there were a lot of mosquitoes being generated. In Puerto Rico, when we looked at it, there was a cemetery that has standing water, 3,000 mosquitoes a day being produced from one cemetery. And so if you do surveillance, tracking, monitoring, you can then target your interventions to try to make a difference. American health system is very complicated because it's a combination of federal, local, and state authorities. Give us a grade, an overall grade, about what cities and counties are doing. I mean, what's the gold standard? Where, where do people need help? And, and when you've diagnosed the people who need help, what are the, is it simply funding? Is it expertise? What are the problems in the places that you've noticed are, are going to be trouble down the road? At CDC, we're a federal agency. Uh, about two-thirds of all of our dollars go out to state and local governments. And I've tried in, in my nearly eight years there to actually increase our ability to support state and local governments, having been a health commissioner in, in New York City for eight right. years. And what we find is uh, there's a wide variability in the capacity, uh, in the funding, in the challenges. Uh, life expectancy varies by six years between different communities in the U.S., your zip code will determine your life expectancy more than your genetic code. And there are parts of the US which have particularly big problems. When it comes to vector control, uh, Florida has an excellent program. There are other places that don't have such strong Florida programs. Florida is the most vulnerable also, is that fair to say? Absolutely, they have had the most travelers, they have very high mosquito counts, they've had dengue here. Texas has also had dengue spread in South Texas. So there are other parts of the U.S. that are vulnerable, but really anywhere there's Aedes aegypti and travelers, you can have Zika spread. So you've just come through a bit of a political ringer. Uh, it's been six or eight months uh, of fighting with Congress to get $1.1 billion of uh, emergency Zika funding. And, and this struck me, we were talking about this before, this struck me as a, a, your house is on fire, uh, you call the fire department and uh, and, and first, the fire department, before they respond, has to go to the city council to see if they have the gasoline to go respond to your house. Break down the political problem for us. Tell us what went wrong, and, 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 and tell us if you think there's going to be a fix, or are you perennially going to be going to Congress and saying, I have an emergency, you guys fight about it for six months, I'll fight it with nothing, and then maybe we won't all die in the meantime. I mean, it seems like it's a very, very dysfunctional system you have right now. Zika was a particular... I'm not goading you to criticize Congress, but if you feel like it, <laughs> please go ahead. They do decide on my budget. Yes, they do. Uh, the Zika was a particularly large problem because it was theoretical for people. First off, it was largely happening in other countries. Second, it was babies who are going to be born in six to nine months, not now. Politicians are pro-baby, generally speaking. Yeah, but they, they looked at it and they said, you know, it's not like uh, Ebola, where everyone was terrified, rightly or wrongly, that they were going to get it. Uh, it's a, although of wider concern, uh, it's something that seemed very theoretical in the future. I can't say why it didn't happen, other than to say that it convinced everyone both parties, both houses of Congress, that they need to do it differently. When there's an earthquake or a tornado, FEMA doesn't go to Congress and say, would you give us money for this? They have a fund. The president declares an emergency and the funds are released. With special authorities so they can work appropriate to an so emergency. So you have no fund? No. You have no emergency, you're the Center for Disease Control and you have no fund? No. My total dollars for urgent needs in a budget of 14 billion is 2.5 million. That's it. What did you have as New York City more health than, commissioner? More than 10 times that much, 30 to 40 million each year that I could use flexibly if there were urgent health needs. Obviously, we know where you stand on this issue. Do you feel as if anyone in Congress, or the executive for that matter, is seized by this issue and wants to do something new about it? The administration has asked for emergency funds in various budget proposals, asked for it in the Zika supplemental as well. Uh, both houses of Congress, Republicans and Democrats see a need for some sort of an emergency fund. And the case is really strong. In FEMA, you have an emergency, you respond to it. In public health, you have an emergency, you can sometimes stop it, do the equivalent of preventing an earthquake. Right. So, I mean, talk about how you found the money that you used over, the, what was it, six months? Uh, um, eight months. Eight 200, months. 224 days, but who's counting? 224 days. How, what did, did you cannibalize for parts? What absolutely, did you do? Absolutely, absolutely. So we had to take money that we need to stop Ebola from re-emerging in West Africa. 
We had to take money from every state in the country and give it to the states that needed more for Zika. We had to cut back on some HIV testing programs. We had to cut back on some immunization programs. Uh, this was all needed to redirect, and that's just within CDC. Within the rest of the government, other things got. I think it's fair cut. to say you're describing a scandal. I mean, it actually is a it actually is a kind of scandal. Are there downstream consequences of not doing the work on Ebola in Africa because you were you were diverting money to this? We work best to manage, so we we do the best we can with the cards we're dealt. That's what you do when you're in the government. Right. But it shows how really important it is that there is an emergency fund created. And I think it could happen. It could happen really in this calendar year with the budget uh, that we hope will get passed in December. Right. Can you talk about a larger popular perception, and you can debunk it or, uh, or confirm it, the, the, the larger, the, the, the perception is that the velocity of these outbreaks, not of, just of Zika, uh, but of all sorts of communicable infectious diseases, uh, is increasing. It might be because of better surveillance. It might be because there's more media coverage of it. But it also feels that, 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 that we, we hear about this more. And, 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 and new diseases you've never heard of crop, cropping up in Asia, for instance. Uh, are we entering a new phase because of globalization, climate change, some combination of all these things, where, where you're going to be in perpetual war footing? Our emergency operations center has been activated 91% of the days that I've been director. And that's almost eight years. Yeah. This is the new normal. The new normal is we expect to find one new pathogen each year. We start a disease outbreak investigation on average once a day. We've helped countries around the world build their disease tracking systems. And around the world, disease uh, investigations start every day. But no one would have predicted Zika. No one would have predicted... We've never before had a mosquito-borne cause of birth defects. We haven't identified a microbial cause of birth defects in more than 50 years. And none of the other viruses that spread like Zika we know to be sexually transmitted what, as what well. What does that mean? I mean, I want to come back to this question of velocity, but what does that mean? I mean, I mean was this a genuinely frightening innovation to your people, who I have to assume are not easily frightened, given what they work with every day? Um, this is the new normal, and I will say that not many things frighten us because we see what's out there. Uh, we worry about areas... But what does it mean epidemiologically that, that there's, a, there, there's a mosquito-borne disease that can cause a birth defect? That seems truly... It was unprecedented. It's alarming. Uh, and it shows that we need to invest more in tracking systems, response systems, and prevention systems. Those are the three pillars of public health. And if you look at the past decade, whether it's or 15 years, whether it's anthrax or H1N1 influenza or bird flu in Asia, uh, Ebola, MERS, SARS, there have been a succession of these. It is the new normal, and we need to be ready. And what's driving it? Global travel, urbanization. We also see in some areas climate is, is increasing risk. Let's talk about the climate piece of this. I mean, is this, is this making your life harder? Climate is complex. Uh, first off, very simply, what many cities have to deal with is more extreme weather events, and those may have major health consequences. Right. Second, it may change uh, the vector, wh where vectors are. So, for example, Lyme disease has a wider distribution because places are now in the U.S. because of climate change. There are other places that are going to be drier, and that's not going to be good for them, but it may make it uh, different in terms of the, mos the mosquito or other populations. Right. A Adaptive response is really the watchword in public health. Uh, we live or die based on whether our data is good enough, whether we have real-time data to make a real-time response. And for that, we need people in place in advance who are tracking trends and identifying when something is happening that's out of the ordinary. Um, let's talk uh, finally. I, I want to come back to Zika. And I want you to, without being alarmist or minimizing, Give us the sense of, of what we're going to be hearing about in the next couple of years. A vaccine is not on the immediate horizon. You say that this has now made itself endemic. It will never be wiped out. Where, how many cases, using some predictive models that you use, uh, how many cases do you expect to see uh, in, in the coming? Because the first domestic transmission, the first local transmission was only in July, I think, when it first cropped up. So where, where are we heading? 
I don't have a crystal ball. And uh, Zika has surprised us. It's been difficult to predict. It's had characteristics that we have not seen with other diseases before. Uh, what we anticipate will happen is that this season will calm down within the continental US. We hope that Miami-Dade will stop having cases, but we can't promise that. Even if they do everything right, there could be cases through the winter. We hope that won't happen. Come next year, uh, we don't know what the season will look like in other parts of the world. In some parts of the world, uh, they're now having a lot of cases. In other parts, come spring, there may be a lot. Come summer, there may be a lot. There aren't enough examples to, to, that are precedent for this. The most similar is chikungunya, spread by the same mosquito. In Puerto Rico, the first year of chikungunya, 25% of the population Could you just into, do one minute on chikungunya because it's not a familiar... Spread by the form. same mosquito, funny word, it means bent over in pain in the African language where the disease was present before. It can cause months of severe pain, unlike Zika, where only 20% of people have symptoms, with chikungunya, about 75% of people have symptoms. So when it hit Puerto Rico, within nine months, really, one out of four people was infected. And we then projected that that's what would happen with Zika, and that's exactly what has happened in this year. The next year, they had very few uh, chikungunya cases, but they also had a drought the next year, which isn't good for mosquitoes. So I, don't, I can't predict with certainty what will happen in the future. I think we will see better ways to control mosquitoes. They will be very labor intensive. It's a ground game against this mosquito, and it, it doesn't work easily. The aerial spraying was very effective, uh, and that may need to be applied in more places. We will see parts of the hemisphere becoming endemic, meaning it comes back every single year. Well, this is, this is actually a very important question because you're actually, there's two stories going on simultaneously. One is mainland US story, the Florida story, and the other is Puerto Rico, which is under your jurisdiction. It's under federal jurisdiction. But it seems to be, uh, you want to go back to this terminology, out of control. Puerto Rico seems to be uh, on its back and down for the count on this. Why is Puerto Rico so different from Florida and from the rest of the US, given that it's a territory of the United States? Well, environmentally, they're friendlier to mosquitoes, basically. The mosquitoes are more numerous there. Um, and the houses don't have screens or air conditioning. The combination of an environment that fosters the tremendous breeding of mosquitoes with more access to humans means that dengue, chikungunya, zika are all much more common there. Um, they made a decision not to do aerial spraying this year, and therefore... And that's a local decision? Yes, yes. You have no ability to override that? No. Not, no, no, not, whatsoever. you know, Constitution says... Right. Uh, other than things reserved for the federal government, it's a state responsibility. Right. That includes Understood. Um, answer this final question. Um, it's, it's something that's... that's, uh, that's uh, bothered me for a while. I can't decide, because uh, I, I used to cover this issue, infectious disease in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's very hard to, 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 to say whether we're very lucky or very unlucky. Uh, we're very unlucky in the sense that you have women across Florida, other parts of the world, um, who are grappling with uh, theoretically and sometimes actual horrifying problem. Um, from a CDC perspective, we might be lucky as a species because we don't yet, we have not yet seen a Zika that's spread through breathing, aer aerosolized uh, type of uh, in infection. Why, why is that? I mean, it, it, do it within the, the framework of, of, of the disasters that maybe we have so far avoided. And what are the chances that we could move? You said that Zika represents a kind of radical innovation. Uh, in, in terms of its ability to create birth defects. You've never seen that before. Are we heading toward a world in which you're going to have uh, a disease like this moving through the air for human-human transmission just through breathing? There's a paradox. <clears throat> on the one hand, paradoxically, we're safer than ever. And on the other hand, we're at greater risk than ever. And many of the same things are driving that. We're more tightly interconnected than ever. Uh, we have better communication tools. And there are new technologies which not only can diagnose, treat, prevent infections, but also create more dangerous organisms, and then intentionally or unintentionally those can be uh, released. So I think the, the answer is uh, we remain at significant risk, and that's why it's so important 
that at city, state, and federal levels, there's investment in public health. There won't be the kind of demand for it that there is for some other services or programs, but it will be there when you need it, whether it's a flu pandemic, which remains the biggest nightmare of all, 50 to 100 million people killed in 1918, 1919 around the world, or drug-resistant bacteria, or the next Zika, Ebola, MERS, SARS, or the next HIV. And it's important to do that not just in this country, but around the world, because a weak link anywhere is a risk to us everywhere. Sobering words. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.